Hiya! I'm Bruce Fumi and this is Scotland History Tours. Now, a recent subscriber asked, do you have something to give me a quick overview of Scottish history? So, this video is going to be a whistle-stop tour to try and do that. If you make it to the end without stabbing an Englishman, then there will be another video with more detail and a contents list that you can click through to the parts of Scottish history that interest you most. Incidentally, don't stab any English people. It probably wasn't them. Nationality is no guide to moral rectitude. Your investment can go down as well as up. Terms and conditions apply. And the stabby thing will get you the jail. So, yeah. so, if you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then why not click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. Scotland's story. Now, Scotland was neither a single landmass or even at this latitude and longitude when dinosaurs walked the earth. I mean, obviously, Nessie has always been Scottish, but apart from that. Anyway, we all came out of Africa, but lots of folks stopped off at other places along the way. Over the centuries, hunter-gatherers, farmers, then Celtic people, Romans, more Celts, then Anglo-Saxons, Vikings, Normans, Flemish, and then, very recently, nation-states started to become a thing. And we'd have, we've had immigration from England, and with global travel, the Asian subcontinent, Hong Kong Chinese, Eastern European countries, blah, 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 blah. Whilst the period in nation states brought immigrants seeking opportunity, even more Scots have left to seek opportunities elsewhere, not realising that the real opportunity was for travel agents. <laughs> now, history is shaped by geography in so many ways. But for ease of organisation, I'm going to structure this based on political changes over time. Now, before the Romans, folk organised in tribal groups. To be fair, some continue to do that for 1800 years, although names and the structure of those tribal groups changed, certainly according to a recent autobiography by Spartacus MacDonald. You, you should buy it. The Romans had limited success in conquering what we call Scotland, but they have left traces. Now, Hadrian's Wall is in England, but there was also a wall from the Clyde across to the Forth, built by a guy called Tony. When the Romans left, folk south of Hadrian's Wall complained about Picts and Scots invading. If we call the folk right up to the Antonine, Tony's Wall, Britons, then north of it there were two distinct groups. Those pre-Roman tribes had coalesced in a political group called the Picts and there was a tribe called the Scots that had come across the Irish Sea. Now, there's some academic debate as to how different they were from the Picts and questions about immigrant versus indigenous Scots, whatever indigenous means. We don't have time for all that detail, so for the rest of the video, please, you'll have to satisfy yourself with criticising my broad generalisations and lack of precision in the comments section below. In roughly 800 AD, the Vikings came and the Picts and the Scots joined together to form Alapa. Now, some non-Gallic speakers incorrectly call it Alba. Stop it! For about 200 years, the Scots' Gallic culture dominated where lots of kings killing one another to try and get to sit on this stone at Schoon. And towards the end of that period, the Gales of Alapa took over the area south of the Fourth Clyde Line apart from Galloway, because they were proper mental. They were part of the gallic -y, viking -y mix of the Western Isles and Western Seaboard. The 11th to the 13th century, I'm going to call the Canmore period, from the time that Malcolm Canmore killed Macbeth, down to the death of the last of that dynasty, Alexander III, power started to consolidate further south, and latterly the Hebrides became part of Scotland under the Lord of the Isles. It was also a period of cultural change, with the royal court becoming Scoto-Norman. Alexander III fell off his horse and broke his neck in 1286 with no surviving male heirs, and this crisis led to Edward of England invading and the Scottish Wars of Independence. You might have seen some films. William Wallace, 
Robert the Bruce, Battle of Bannockburn, Flower of Scotland. Long story short, we won eventually, but the people in charge were still Norman. It's like having your spell checker set to UK English, but calling your school dance a prom. What's wrong with you people? With independence won, then came the Stuart Kings. Now this is a huge period from 1371 to 1688, or 1714, depending on whether or not you're a Jacobite. We'll come to them. Broadly speaking, we had a lot of kings called James or Mary. Actually, Mary was a queen, although it's thought that her son James was also a queen. It was James VI becoming King of England in 1603 that would mean a hundred years later... <sighs> In the Stuart dynasty, Scotland moved from medieval to renaissance during the reigns of James I to the V, broadly speaking. Then, reformation to Presbyterianism during the time of his daughter, Mary. All this time would continue to battle with our nearest and dearest neighbour. Even when the two countries weren't officially at war, the clans either side of the border would fight each other, steal livestock from each other and generally live in a state of near lawlessness. And yet, they would see the northern clans in the Highlands as barbarians. So that's right, this is the big period of clans. After Mary came James VI, the bisexual, Shakespeare-inspiring witch hunter who hated Highland clan culture and tried to stamp it out. Now that culture originally came from the north of Ireland and James sent lowland Presbyterians to the north of Ireland to stamp it out there. Well in May. It was also during the reign of James VI that the Mayflower sailed to the Americas to organise a Thanksgiving dinner. He commissioned the King James Bible and the Protestant religion became securely established in Scotland. Now the uneasy coexistence of the Presbyterian Church and royalty led to war with James's son, Charles, and that civil war spread all over his three kingdoms but the people south of the border call it the English Civil War, what they like. After that, there was religious persecution of Scottish Presbyterian Covenanters under Charles II in what became known as the Killing Times. When Charles I's other son, James VII or II, was ousted from England by a Dutch invader called William of Orange, then some folks were upset at the overthrow of the rightful King James VII the second if you're in England, whose name Jacobus in Latin gives us Jacobites. Now, most of them became actors in the TV series Outlander. Anyway, Culloden, the last pitched battle on British soil, led to victory for the Hanoverian side over James's supporters and a determination to crush the entire way of life of these Highland tribespeople who'd supported James. Clearing people from the land for larger scale modernised farming techniques had been going on for a while now in England and in the Lowlands, but now it was brutally imposed in the Highlands. Forty years before Culloden, the debate about who was the rightful king had led to England imposing a union on Scotland so that Scotland would never be allowed to choose its own king and threaten England from the north. And so, from 1707, Scottish history becomes a largely ignored subset of British history. Now, one of the consequences of post-Reformation Scottish Presbyterianism had been that Scots had a desire to commune directly with God, so that people had learned to read the Bible for themselves, and Scotland was highly literate. For many, those high levels of literacy and education were just about to bear fruit. It meant that Scots punched above their weight in philosophy, science, engineering and positions of administration in an expanding British Empire. And so, the 18th century and the 19th century were periods of migration. Some Scots left these shores for the opportunities that they saw in the colonies. Many more left with no choice, as a result of poverty, clearance or penal servitude. Now, as the timeline gets closer to present day, viewers get even more caught up with their own political views. So at some point, I'm probably going to need to put on a tin hat. But migration continues up to the present day. My own wife 
was born in Australia to Scottish parents who then came back to Scotland. But that large-scale diaspora creation is rooted in that post culloden destruction of the Highlands. And I kind of think that's why so many folks in North America and the Antipodes hark back to clans, which in Scotland itself are largely a forgotten thing of the past. Here, things had moved on through the Industrial Revolution and those highly educated and inventive Scotsmen meant that every day you used things invented or discovered by Scots without realising the contribution that this little nation has made on the world. At one point during the Industrial Age, 20% of the ships built in the world were built along one Scottish river. There was a period where Scotland seemed to benefit from sharing an English trade and global conflict meant that people pulled together as a unit through the Seven Years' War, Napoleonic Wars, Opium Wars, Boer War, the First and Second World Wars. By the post-war period, Britishness had firmly established itself and liberalism, then democratic socialism meant advances were made in social mobility, the welfare state and national health service. But where earlier globalisation benefited Scotland, there was a new round of globalisation and waning British power. That war between left and right of the 20th century, where the Clyde ran red, was largely won by reactionary conservative forces in the Thatcher years. That gave us a drive for individualism and pitting one against the other. A breakdown of social cohesion and the distinctive political allegiances North and South meant that in previously Labour support in Scotland, there's now a greater desire to regain independence than at any time since the 18th century. Scotland is now broadly divided between those who for historical, emotional or political reasons would rather take control as free swimming fish in an inevitably smaller pond and those who prefer a big goldfish bowl where even the erstwhile comrades in the northern English industrial towns seem to vote conservative. Who knows what the future will hold? Now, 12 minutes doesn't leave space for detail or nuance, but I'm making another video that's available now and I'll update over time. That video will have links to various playlists with lots of short videos in each different time period and subject and I'll add to them each week. Now if that sounds like it's for you then please click here now. Otherwise YouTube will provide you with an alternative option here. Hamindokas can be a lamb ally. Cheer and